In the year 1943, a merchant ship left the Clyde, outward bound for New York. In the attempt to dodge attention from German U-boats, she was threading a careful passage through the many islands of the Scottish West Coast when, without warning, she became enveloped in a dense sea fog and ran aground on a reef between two Hebridean islands. A very minor event in a global conflict. It might now be scarcely even a memory, were it not that the cargo aboard the SS cabinet minister was to have such a profound effect on the local population. To mark the 50th anniversary, we talked to some of those who had been directly involved. We were delighted to find two people in particular who had more reason than most to remember the occasion. Odd. O-D-D, -D, Odd. What was Odd? <laughs> no, no, that's, that's my name, Odd. Alfred Ernest Odd. And uh, this is my wife, Peggy. <laughs> Peggy Macaroon, as was, uh, before we were married. And is it true what they tell me? You're just about to celebrate your golden wedding, tonight. Aye. Fifty years married this spring. Wonderful. We were married just six weeks after the minister went aground. In fact, you could say we might never have had a wedding at all if that ship hadn't run aground when she did. Really? Aye, really. You see, the army had taken me away from the islands for about 18 months, and when I come back, full of hope, things seem to have changed a lot, and not for the better either. Changed in what way? Well, everybody just seemed to have sort of slowed down somehow, and it was obvious before even I got off the boat that Peggy's father hadn't trimmed his moustache in a very long time. Hello, Mr. McCroon. It's great to see you after all this time. Aye, uh, aye. Uh, uh, hello, Sergeant Major. It's great to be back. Uh, Fauci, don't do it, Sergeant Major. Fauci, don't do it. Uh, how's, um, how's everything on little Toddy? Terrible. Just as bad as you. Terrible. Nothing wrong with Peggy, is there? Oh, what would be wrong with Peggy? Or Keaton, for that matter. They're all right, then? All right. They're smoking away the pair of them like two beets. What a pity the government hadn't run out of cigarettes instead. Instead of what? Oh, would you look at poor Roderick yonder. You can see the stuff isn't there by the way the man's shoulders have died on him. Oh, Daniel Boch, it's me that's sorry for the poor soul. Well, listen, I think you better come up to the hotel for a dram with me. To cheer you up while you're waiting for the mails to be sorted. We can't go for a dram, Sergeant Major. Because there hasn't been a drop of whiskey in the two islands for twelve days now. Not a drop? Not a drop. And for a month before that, the stuff was in such short supply that Big Roderick at the hotel yonder was handing it out like it was his own blood. And now there's the island queen over from Obig again. And again, bringing not a drop with her. Aye, well, we're all a bit bloodless now... You and me will just be getting down to the morning star. I confess, at the time, I still didn't realise the full extent of the calamity or its implications. Too preoccupied with my own problems, I suppose. Anyway, as my future father-in-law's wee boat carried us the two miles over the water to little Toddy here, I was still after... Just one thing. I uh, I was hoping we might settle the date when me and Peggy got safely married, Mr. McCrum. Uh, yes, well, uh, well, well, we'll be talking about that when the summer's over. That'll be time enough. Don't you think just before Easter will be a good time? Well, just before Easter? You have some very peculiar thoughts. Well, just after Easter. Anyway, before April's uh, out. We, we'd better talk about it when the summer's over don't know at all why you're in such a hurry. If you've been wanting to marry a girl for nearly two years, you'd be in a hurry too, Mr. McCrew. Uh, you, you sure you won't just have a bottle of ginger ale? No, thanks, Mr. McCrew. Uh, or a, 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 a bottle of lemonade? Or a bottle of lemonade. Oh, don't blame you. And that's another thing. 
boys. How could you have a wedding when there is no whiskey? There's bound to be plenty by the end of April. Oh, it's easy to see you've been out of the country, Sergeant Major. There hasn't been plenty of whiskey in these islands for a year and more. What about if Peggy's called up? Peggy would be called up. She's indispensable to my post office. They might say Kate Ann could do that for you. Kate Ann's an agricultural worker. She's indispensable to my craft. All the same, I think... would you hark at the way that wind's blowing up now, Sergeant Major? Oh, we'll have a dirty night, I'm afraid. Don't you think so? Aye. A very dirty night. <laughs> Aye, it's possible to laugh at it now, but at that time I was... Hey, hey, here. Don't think it all turned out happy ending fairy tale stuff, but there was tragedy in it too, you know. Do you remember... Poor old Alec McPhee. Do I remember him? Oh, didn't you, Buck? I can still see him in my mind's eye. Him with his great white beard, 90 years of age and a back as stiff as a ramrod. Merchant Navy captain he was. Sailed the seven seas. And that was before even the Franco-Prussian War. Oh, he was a man that looked as if he would live forever. Aye, and yet he was gone almost before my father's boat got you across the coolest. We we didn't know it at the time, but as as Peggy and me sat talking that night, Captain McPhee's friends were already gathering for his cabbages. Caddish. <laughs> That's what we call a wake in these parts. Ah, oh, Morag. Hey, Tal. Oh, the captain went terrible quick. Oh, it was better that way. He lived a terrible long time before he went at all, and I'm sure himself would have wanted to go quick. Ah, uh, that would be the way of it now. The Botic was always so quick about everything. Our Flora got as thin as a bone the way she would be chimping when he was always putting his head round the door so quick. <laughs> now there's plenty more tea and scones in the kitchen and you'll just be helping yourselves when I go back home. Stop a lot, stop a lot, Devora. Thank you, Ma. Ah, well, well. Oh, it's not for us to crumple at what the Lord provides for us. All the same, I believe the captain would have crumpled if he was sitting up here with us this night. In what way do you mean? Oh, I've often seen him drink a cup of tea, right enough. But he would never be looking at it so lovingly before he drank it, the way he would be looking at a dram. That's right, Biffer. Oh, it was a pleasure to see the way he would be looking at a dram before he put it to his mouth. A cruy. Oh, many's the time I've called for one myself just because the captain had enjoyed his own so much. Well, well, well. Indeed. Fancy a man who's travelled all over the world like the captain having to stand before his creator just for the want of a pint of beer. Oh, it wasn't the pint of beer that killed the captain, if ever. Ah, oh, yes, it was a shock right enough when I had to tell him he could not be having his third pint. But if his constitution had not been so powerfully weakened from want of whisky, himself would be sitting where I'm sitting now, in his own armchair. Ah, gunya, gunya. We are all miserable worms in the eyes of the Lord. He just stamps on us when he has a mind to. Aye, aye, that's the way of it now. Dr. McLaren told me that for the last 15 years, the captain had drank his three drams of whiskey and three pints of beer every night of his life. On such a tonic, he might have lived to be a hundred, he said. And now tonight he wasn't even able to get his third pint of beer. Uh, well, isn't it the same rule for everybody? They say, though, that he was just blazing with indignation. I just told the captain he had to have his two pints and no man could have more. And him just turning away without a word, walking home to his house here, then giving up the ghost. Well, whatever a hotelier might feel within himself, it has to be the same rule for all... Or no rule at all. Uh, uh, Roderick. Uh, <sighs> oh, when do you think we'll be seeing whiskey again? Oh, and how would I know? 
Uh, wasn't even the minister's wife asking me that very question this afternoon? The minister's wife? Oh, I didn't know the minister's uh, wife was... Uh, Mr. MacLeod, don't be laughing, please. <laughs> Mrs. Morrison was wanting some whiskey for the minister's call. Oh, 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 my brother Simon went up to the manse to see the minister, and he says the poor soul has no more voice in him than a bit of dead grass in the wind. I, I, I know how he feels. I'm almost afraid to light up a pipe now. The hair in my face is that dry. Uh, oh, we are all running terribly low. Ami Say when. Uh, well, now if you'll just add sugar and hot water, old lady, I'll drink it when I'm up in bed. Very good, dear. I rather think I caught a germ at the manse this afternoon. Mr. Morrison really ought to keep that cold of his to himself. Oh, no, dear, I think it's so selfish the way people scatter colds all over the place. I do hope you've caught it in time. Uh, you mean not caught it, Dolly? Yes, of course, dear. How silly of me. I think if I drink a double ration of hot grog, I may fend it off. That's the beauty of only drinking whiskey on rare occasions. One gets the benefit of it when one does drink. Yes, dear. You are worried about me because there are no lemons, aren't you? I did try to get one. Well, don't worry, old lady. A la guerre, comme a la guerre, as the French used to say in the last war. Mrs. Morrison was complaining that she couldn't get any whiskey, even for the minister. We still have another bottle. I know, but if every time people run out we're going to be called on to supply it, we shall be in the same position as them. No, no, no. They must learn not to be improvident. Improvidence is the besetting sin of the islands. It's in the blood, I tell you. In the blood. You go on, dear, and get quickly into bed. I'll bring this up to you. Hello, yeah, old girl. It's even getting a hold of a man like Sergeant Major Odd. I'd no idea who was coming across from the mainland this evening, and I must say I'm rather surprised he didn't report here to Snorvig House before he crossed over to Little Toddy. Oh, well, Paul, I expect he was anxious to see Peggy McCroon. Hmm. He has been away a long time. Exactly my point. He should have come up here as soon as he got off the boat. Is your drink all right, dear? Yeah. What? Ah. Oh, well. Ah. Excellent. I wonder if the Sergeant Major and Peggy McCroon will be getting married I'm soon. afraid I'm more anxious to know if he will be able to smarten up my men. They're getting terribly slack. Oh, it's disheartening for you, Paul. After all the trouble you've taken with them. When duty calls, Dolly, we don't consider our personal feelings. Right. Bedtime. Oh, where's that book I was reading? Who put it away? What's it called? The Death in the Jam Pot. It's a crime club novel. Oh, dear. I believe I did put it away. Silly of me. Well, I thought you'd finished with it. Well, don't you start going native on me, old lady. Can't you be in a margin and leave you be single on? Can't you be in a margin and leave you be single on? Can't you be in a margin and leave you be single on? Now, sir, in a and dance, call it there. Here's an old friend back from barbarous places like Africa and death, and I haven't a sensation to put before him, not so much as a wee snifter. I've nothing to offer you but my own armchair. Sit down in it, Sergeant Major. Sit down in it. Now, really, Father McAllister, I'll take this one. You'll do nothing of the kind, my boy. You're in my parish, and you'll sit where the priest tells you to sit. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Uh, you may be a heretic in matters of faith, but you'll not be a heretic in matters of behaviour. Mm. Well, what's wrong with you, man? Put your backside down where your backside ought to be. It's not a fence you're sitting on. <laughs> yes, Father. That's ah, more the style. Now, this is not the real Mackay. Ah, huna, huna. No, indeed. It's a little better than Joseph Ginger Ale. Kate <laughs> <laughs> Milia Falcha. Agus Lanchevor. Slanchevor. Mm -hmm. ah. ah, well, we're in a pretty bad way right enough. What wine is it exactly, Father? 
altar wine, my boy. It's the best I can offer, indeed. It's all I can offer. I think it's very nice. Ah, well, it's drinkable. Uh, but only just, Pajingo. So, tell me, when are you going to marry Peggy Elisic? I'd marry her tomorrow if I could, but Peggy won't go against her father's oh, wishes. Oh, quite rightly, of course. Yeah, of course, but... Ah, you can't get the old man up to scratch, eh? Every time I try to pin him down, every time he turns the talk to someone else. Yeah, he's pretty good at that, is Joseph. All of last night I tried, and most of today. In the end, I held out for Easter. And he held out for not talking at all till the summer's over. Yeah, that's the worst of these fathers that are left without a wife. All they think about is turning their daughters into slaves. What's your advice, Father McAllister? My advice is to roll right over them and marry her at Easter. <laughs> she's a lovely, beautiful girl, and she's a good girl. Roll right over them, my boy. It's jolly difficult to roll over Joseph McCroon. He isn't there when you start in rolling. <laughs> Joseph can be slippery right enough. But don't you worry yourself, Sergeant Major. I'll speak to him. I'll tell him he's got to have the wedding at Easter. And if he won't agree, I'll roll right over him myself. <laughs> now, let's have another glass of this stuff to seal the bag. Mind you... We weren't the only ones having a bit of trouble in naming the day. <laughs> I mean, with Fred here being Church of England and yeah. the whole of Toddy Bake being Catholic, <laughs> it presented us with some difficulties on top of those my father was making. But, oh, we had no problems at all compared to what poor George Campbell had to face. Uh -huh. Anyway, we, we heard later that... George Campbell and Katrina McLeod had uh, agreed to get married that same day I arrived back here. That was the reason they said George wasn't at Captain McPhee's carriage. <laughs> he was hurrying home, he informed them, to tell his mother all about their plans, or so he thought. <laughs> Good evening, Mother. What a time to come back! only quarter to ten. And where have you been? Uh, the lorry was a little late leaving Snork. Captain McPhee died suddenly this evening. Huh. Well, it's not for us to speak against those who have passed on, and I'm told he took to reading his Bible last year, but what good it could do him after spending every night drinking up at the bar, I wouldn't care to say. I uh, know, Mother. You haven't been up at the bar tonight, have you? Good gracious me, no, Mother. Why do you ask that? You're avoiding me. You're looking guilty, George. You're not looking me straight in the face. George! Yes, Mother? You've been drinking. I have not been drinking. I couldn't have been drinking. And why not? Because there's not a drop of whiskey in the whole island. These islands are swimming in the stuff. They've always been swimming in it. Uh, well, there's none now. There's a shortage on account of the war. The Lord is merciful indeed. What a lesson for us. We go to war on the Sabbath day, but he returns good for evil and leads us out of temptation. Well, if you've not been drinking, what have you been doing all this time? Uh, I, uh, I went to see Norma MacLeod at what has it. That good for nothing. I don't know what the education authority is thinking of, letting a radical, the like of that, corrupt the minds of the children. He's been called up. He's going into the Air Force. The best place for him. He's never had both feet on the ground since he could walk. Diana, give us tea. That sister of his? Aye. A rattle plate of a girl, just like her mother before her. Permanent wave, indeed. Permanent wickedness, more like. Katrina looks after her brother very well. And what do you know about being looked after when you've had nobody to look after you but your mother? You'll learn the difference if you're ever foolish enough to think of marrying one of these modern girls. Yes, Mother. It's time we were going to bed. High time indeed with the Sabbath close upon us. Just you make sure everything's properly locked up now. <sighs> yes, Mother. Do you hear me, George? Yes, Mother. I, I smell something good in the kitchen. Golden plover, Doctor. Isn't it splendid? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Dinner's ready. Now get yourselves round the table. I uh, wasn't expecting to see you here, Dr. McLeod. Oh, I never missed the chance for a meal cooked by Katrina. 
and here is something good enough to wash down plover, as fine as that's going to be. <coughs> ah, <laughs> well, 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 Doctor, you're a darling. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the last of my claret. I hope I didn't shake it up too much in the car. There was no need, Doctor McLaren, but thank you very much indeed. Aye, a toast then. To Katrina and George. To Katrina and George. Well, I did not have the pleasure of bringing either of you into the world, but I hope I have the pleasure of bringing a few of your children into it. Eh? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Dr. McLaren, is you? Ah, George, you're a lucky man. You're going to marry one of my favourite lassies in the island. Not sure she isn't the pick of the whole bunch. <laughs> well, she is that to me, Doctor. Dash it, George, I don't know how you manage that. Oh, no, I, I'm not casting reflections on your worthiness. No, no, I was uh, merely animadverting on your modesty. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> well, here's to you both. And may you be happy and prosperous, and, uh, except for the occasional incident alluded to, may you never see me across your threshold in my professional capacity. Oh, thank you, Dr. McLaren. No! Eat up, boy. Oh, he was a lovely young fellow, was George Campbell. Though, to be honest, there's many in the two islands despaired of him ever working up the courage to face yon mother of his once and for all. They say a tree is known by its fruits, but how could anyone on this earth explain the Campbells? <laughs> You were going to tell me last night? Yes, I was, Mother. But you seem so anxious to go to bed. The bed I have made for myself and on which I must lie. Mother, you... Oh, this is what comes of spoiling my only child. Of spoiling me? Spare the rod. You never did. And spoil the child. And now in my old age I am reaping as I have sown. To think that I would be hearing from others that my own son is to be married. I only knew it myself yesterday afternoon. Do you mean to stand? there, George, and tell me you'd not been thinking about this girl until yesterday. I, I'd, I'd thought about her, yes. Then why was I kept in the dark about your thoughts? What would have been the use of upsetting you? Ah, so you knew it would upset me. I mean, upset you by the uncertainty until I knew what Katriana's feelings were. You knew it would upset me, and yet you went on thinking only of yourself. Oh, shouldn't we go inside to discuss this? You wanted to marry that girl, and if it meant breaking your old mother's heart, you were set on having your way. Katriana is a very nice girl. Your father had as much trouble with her father as with any crofter in Great Toddy. Wasn't he the one who loosed the Gary Boo Bull on your father and the sheriff's men? No wonder his son grew up to be one of these good-for-nothing socialists. A lot of good people are socialists nowadays, Mother. A set of thieves breaking the Tenth Commandment every hour of the day. We must move with the times. Will there be any times to move with in eternity? Oh, you're bringing religion into it now, Mother. And you're pushing religion aside for what some people would call a pretty face. Well, I'm not going to interfere. You're not? No. I'll simply go and live in Glasgow with your Aunt Dinah. But you hate Glasgow, Mother. The Lord just dies at those me loves. Oh, surely you can try living here with Katriana. Does she smoke? I believe she smokes a cigarette occasionally. Do you ever see me smoke? You don't like smoking. Did the Apostle Paul smoke? Uh, mother, if I bring Katriana to tea next Saturday, will you be nice to her? The day you bring Katrina McLeod to this house, that day I leave it and go to Glasgow. And now you'd better go and feed these hens, for I was too upset by what Jemima Ross told me to attend to their needs myself. Oh, out of my way, the lot of them. No need to ask how you are, sir. Anyone can see you're in the pink. Yes, I'm very well, Sergeant Major. Had a bit of a cold threatening over the weekend, but managed to fight it off all right. Glad to hear it, sir. Paddy, get up, old man, and let Sergeant Major Hard get to his chair. It's all right, sir. I can step over him. Oh, oh! oh. Oh, well, uh, um, I, I could have stepped over him, sir, if he hadn't stood up when he did. Down, Paddy. Uh, he's a big dog. Yes, even for an Irish setter. Down, sir. Well, <laughs> this is a...
cosy little foxhole and no mistake. Oh, those are photographs of shoots friends and I used to take before I bought Snorvig House here. That's Huckleberry in Essex, best partridge shoot within easy reach of London. Looks very fine, sir. Fine, yes, but I wouldn't exchange any of those places for my own little shooting and fishing in the two toddies. People in London thought I was mad when I came to live up here, but I've never regretted it. Never, sir? Never once. I feel I'm of some use to the islands. Of course, if the people would listen more to what I tell them, I could be of even more use. Of course, sir. Talking of which, Sergeant Major, I am very disappointed in G Company's attendance at parades. Sorry to hear that, sir. Been growing steadily less for a year now, but lately it's been appalling. I'm sure we'll be able to work up the keenness again, sir. The whiskey and beer situation can't last forever. When you were in Africa, Sergeant Major, were you out in the sun a great deal? <laughs> well, what I meant to say, sir, I think they're all feeling the effect of the shortage. A shortage that affects us all equally. Mm. I'm very fond of the toddy folks, Sergeant Major, but it's no use shutting one's eyes to the fact that they lack staying power. Well, they were keen enough when there was a chance Jerry would try to invade us, sir. And now the danger of immediate invasion has faded, all that keenness has vanished. They're not sporting. Now, that's where the English are superior to every other nation in the world. We play the game for the sake of the game. Other nations play just for the sake of winning. I shall do my best to butt things up, sir. And talking of which, I wish you could persuade your future father-in-law to be a little more strict about the blackout in Little Toddy. Well, with all the lighthouses and arbor lights going strong, the people can't understand the point of the blackout. Same old story, no idea of discipline. The whole point of the blackout, tell him, is to show the determination of the British to win the war. Anyway, an order is an order, surely. Quite so. But... Uh, it is a bit refreshing to find people who think more of what you might call a common sense order. Rather strong, coming from you, Sergeant Major. You're undoubtedly right, sir. I'll say a word in Joseph McCroon's ear. Thank you. Now, I think it would be rather a good idea if I were to run you around the island in the car. I'd like the whole of G Company to see that you're back with us. Just as you say, sir. Uh, well, let's get into action, then. Sir. Oh. Uh, oh. Down, Paddy, old man. That's that fella. Uh, good dog. Very, very good dog. <laughs> Something must be done, Sergeant Major. Something to bring home to these people that there still is a war on. I think the drought of whiskey may have taught them that, sir. What? Seriously, sir, I don't believe prosecutions would do a bit of good. They're not easy to drive out here, but nobody could wish for a better lot of fellas to lead. I don't want to prosecute, Sergeant Major. It's no pleasure to me. I mean, I could have prosecuted a lot of people for poaching, but I never have. Fortunately, the command of the Home Guard isn't my private affair. I'm the representative of the country's will to victory. I must say I was really disappointed in Captain Wackett. I mean, I thought I got him right off that prosecution lot, but then I found out much later he'd gone straight home and written an official letter to District Security about the people here. Now that was wrong, very wrong. I was very disappointed in him over that. To Captain P. Syndrome Quiblick, Security Intelligence Service, from Captain Paul Waggett. Dear Captain Quiblick, I feel I ought to let you know that there seems to be a wave of defeatism in this island at present. It has affected the Home Guard to some extent, uh, and I think it might be worth your while I am much obliged for your letter of the 22nd inst. I am taking steps accordingly. Lieutenant Boggast will arrive at Snorvig on Saturday the 27th inst. He will travel under the name of W.A. Brown, and his apparent object will be to inquire into the tweed industry on both islands. Disappointment, a great disappointment, was what I felt when I heard the security had been brought in. Oh, there was no need for that at all. No, but then again, it did give us all a good laugh after <laughs> Father James got caught up in it. <laughs> for, a, for a priest, he had what you might call a devilish sense of humour. <laughs> <laughs> to put you in the picture, uh, but the northwest of the island here is Baggy Groin, Macroon's Bay, and it's yeah. always been a great place for flotsam. The way it opens out to catch whatever the wide Atlantic Ocean has got to offer. And it pleases the good Lord to lead us to. <laughs> oh, and it can offer a lot that's very acceptable, especially in wartime when everything was so scarce. At different times, I remember 
We had absolutely dozens of whole cheeses from the shore yonder. Oh, and you couldn't count the number of great big boxes of lard. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've seen tinned asparagus and turpentine and crates of this stuff lifted off of the sand up there. <laughs> Tires for two lorries and enough tomato juice for a generation. From pit props to vegetable oil, you name it, we get it. Anyway... Just about the time Captain Waggett's spy started his investigation <laughs> after a spell of bad weather, two of the local crofters took a walk out to the bay one night just to see what fortune might have washed ashore for them. A verse of ice, Mr. It's the heaviest. Well, this'll do here, then. Get down with it. <clears throat> Let's, let's have a look now. What does it say? Uh, it's addressed to uh, the manager, City and Suburban Bank, Lombard Street, London, EC, England. Ah, uh. uh, well, well. I don't think she will be whiskey, Jockey. No, I don't think she will be. It's too heavy for whiskey altogether. Oh, it's terrible heavy. Look at all that iron that's around it. Uh, it would make her heavy if she wasn't heavy at all. The manager, city and suburban... B uh, I wonder if it could be gold. Gold? No, he Do you want everybody in the island to hear you screeching about it? If it isn't gold, it must be something pretty valuable, I believe. Who would be sending a box like this to a bank if it was just nothing at all? Oh, it must be gold right enough. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is better than yon Chinese paper banknotes that came ashore by Art Swish. Aye, yeah, a lot better. There wasn't many things you could do with Chinese paper banknotes. No, not many. Now, the big question is, what do we do with this? What should we do with it? Mm. We'll take it back to your place or my place and open it right away. That's what we'll do with it. Aye, let the whole island know we had something by the noise we'd be making in the middle of the night. Uh, no, no. Uh, we'll hide it, and you're here, Rick. And you'll send word tomorrow morning while well, I come along to give you a hand with your plough because it's broken. And then if there's a lot of hammering, they'll all be thinking it's your plan. <laughs> very good, you. Very good. <laughs> ah, well, it's you that's smart right enough. <laughs> uh, uh, care's not. Uh, up with her now. <laughs> oh, the sooner we get it to your Rick Rebetha. That moon's as bright as day. Ah, the poor souls, Jockey Stewart and Hugh Macroon. Fosh he or a gaviak and ye and could you proch. The thing is, next morning they discovered that someone had been in the jockey's hayrick while they were sleeping. <laughs> the box of gold was gone. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing left but scattered hay. Uh, um, and before they could start looking for the culprits, who should arrive in the arbour but Captain Waggett's security officer. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've forgotten his name now. He's a, a lieutenant, he, he was. A, a Boggist. Lieutenant Boggist. Oh, oh, aye, Lieutenant Boggist. I knew I'd get it if I kept thinking of something phony. <laughs> and then you bock the poor man. The people here just kept passing him from one to the other, each one giving him more confusing information than the last, till he finished up leaving the island knowing everything there was to <laughs> know about absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All the same, by this time, Hugh McCune and Jockey Stewart were convinced it was all to do with them, so they went for advice from the one man everybody could trust. And as usual, Father James had his finger right on the pulse. It took him no time at all to locate their box again. It was lying concealed in my future father-in-law's back shed. Oh, well, if 
playing does keepers? <laughs> Father James had the box opened and they, they tell me he nearly died laughing, <laughs> literally, for when, when it turned out to contain not gold but, but human ashes. <laughs> Great metal full of the stuff. The result of, of some important cremation in Toronto. And from what we heard afterwards, Lieutenant Bogus found the box mysteriously in his cabin on the island Queen and decided to do nothing until he should have a witness present. So he carried it all the way back to security headquarters at Novus. I, 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 I'd have given half me pension to have been there to see Major Quiblick's face when I, when I opened it. I expect he and Lieutenant Bogus exchanged some very intelligent looks. <laughs> Oh, Lieutenant Bogus. Oh, the poor through again. <laughs> it's all very well for you pair to sit there and say he can't help himself. If he can't help himself, how is he ever going to be able to help me? Oh, it'll be all right when you're married, Katrina. And if he hasn't the pluck to ask me to tea at his own house, how will he ever find the pluck to marry me? Uh, mind you, I have it on very good authority that he very nearly solved the problem one night recently. <laughs> nearly? Oh, I believe I'll just write and tell him we nearly got married. But it was all a mistake, and now he can just marry Jemima Ross. Oh, no, that could frighten him into doing the right thing, Katrina. <laughs> but I think a couple of good drams in him would do the trick. If I could only get outside a couple of really good drams, I'd go and tackle his old lady myself. Yeah. Thank you for nothing. <laughs> it's not me that's going to be married on the strength of my brother's long tongue when he's carrying a big load of whiskey. Oh, oh say that again. Say what? A big load of whisky. Oh, that's poetry you're talking. <laughs> ah, be done with your nonsense. I've no patience with you, any of you. Just as soft as dough, that's what <laughs> men are. Am I not right, Dr. McLaren? Oh, well, I... Just as soft as dough they are. Oh, well, I am sorry for you, Katrina, because George is being so feeble. And I'm sorry for your brother here who can't enjoy a dram with old friends before he goes into uniform. Uh, the sorry state. You never spoke with more felicity. I'm sorry as to all for old Hector McCrory. Aye. Makes me feel like no kind of doctor at all when I can give him nothing better for his rheumatics than some confounded extract of coal tar. <laughs> it's a pity one of your extracts wouldn't bring George Campbell up to scratch. Aye, well, I better be on my way. Yeah, the weather's getting worse for the look of things. Aye, aye, it's settling in for a real pea super right enough. And a right pea super it was, too. About as bad as anything I've seen on this island. So bad that nobody really expected Captain McKechnie to get the island queen over that night. But, but Captain McKechnie was one of the old school, and, and, and when word went round that he'd brought her into Snorvig on that Saturday night, they tell me they was all headed for the hotel hot foot. All excited and hopeful they was, thinking their troubles were over at last. Oh, no. But what the Queen brought for them from all back that time wasn't at all what they were hoping for, no. Not at all what they had been hoping for. Dear sir, I am informed that the conversation in the Snorvig Hotel is often unduly critical of the conduct of the war. I earnestly hope that in future you will exercise your influence as landlord to check such criticism to the best of your ability. We must all remember that we are fighting for our existence against... A and he goes on and on and on again. And then he signs himself P. St. John Quibalic, Major Sick. Sick? And St. John... Oh, look at that now for a piece of impudence. Joseph Macroon himself would never be signing himself St. John. S.I.C. means Security Intelligence Corps. It's written the same on this letter to me. <laughs> no intelligence at all. Just a lot of nonsense. What is the clown after saying to you, Archie? Oh, uh, dear sir, I have to notify you that I have received a report that on at least three occasions you indulged in careless talk about the movement of shipping. Viz? What uh, kind of a ship is that? What? Viz. Well, I don't believe it's a ship at all, Druby. It's one of those words those government fellows write when they want to get anybody into a bit of a muddle. Huh? Where was it? Oh, yes. The movement of shipping, viz, 
On the 27th, Alt. On the... What's an Oost? But it's another kind of viz. I'll never be done, Drooby, if you keep on asking so many questions. You ought to belong to the government yourself. <laughs> viz, on the 27th, Alt. On the 28th, Alt. And on the 1st, Inst. Yeah. Hey, all he means, Drooby, is last Saturday, Sunday and Monday. But then why can't he say that if that's what he means? Well, it's the way these fellows have to write. Alt just means February. Well, you were after saying just now that it meant Saturday. Oh. Let the man read his letter, Drooby. You and your alt and your viz. It's the right way when you're sending an official communication. You get plenty such letters when you're on the county council, uh, but I don't pay much attention to them. Realise that you did not intend to do any harm, but in mentioning that your son was sailing from a certain port at a certain time for a certain destination, you might have been giving valuable assistance to enemy agents who are always on the... Did you ever have this one on the council, Roderick? Quai Vive. Quai Vive? No. No, that's a new one on me, no, right no. enough. On the Quai Vive for information that can be communicated to enemy submarines. I hope that in future you will keep a close check on your tongue. Oh. Did anybody ever hear the likes of such nonsense? Ah, uh, but I know who it was. It, it, it was that fellow Brown I took over to kill Todd last Monday. Oh, John Tweet Merchant. Tweet <laughs> Merchant. Oh, the tweet he ever bought, he put round his own backside. <laughs> Mr. Brown, eh? Uh, just let the rascal come back here and he'll be all the colours of the rainbow before I've finished with him. <laughs> I, I'm surprised you're not after having a letter, Druby. Uh, you were opening your mouth pretty wide too about the home guard. Well, I wasn't in at the post office yet, but if I'll have a letter like that on Monday morning, I'll throw the... It's true, I say no more. Hear me, everybody. The fog's still very thick. I nearly turned into the manse, Roderick, instead of your hotel. Uh, you would find just as much to drink there as you'll find here, Mr. Wackett. Yes, well, I'm sorry to hear supplies are so short. Still just half a pint per man, eh? Just a half pint each per day. Then I'm afraid I can't offer to stand around. <laughs> Still, we must remember that every drop of whiskey we don't drink is helping to pay for the war. Yeah, so is every drop we drink, the way it's taxed. And I'd sooner pay for the war drinking whiskey tax and all than by not drinking it. <laughs> ah, but the point is that by not drinking whiskey, the whiskey goes to America, which means the Americans are helping to pay for the war. But we mustn't grumble. That's one of the reasons I've come to the bar this evening. I've had a letter from Major Quibrick at Nobbles. A lot of us are after having letters from Major Quibalik. Mm. Uh, some people have nothing better to do than write a lot of letters. But it really won't do to give people the impression that there is any defeatism here. However, if Major Quibrick has written directly to some of you, I shan't say any more about that. But what really brought me along this evening is to ask if any of you know anything about a very large urn filled with human ashes. Didn't I tell you before? Hmm? Ever since he got command of the Home Guard, he's been going more and more quickly, slowly off his head. <laughs> no one? Well, as Major Quiblick points out in his letter to me, it might easily have been a time bomb. There's the proof. Your Major Quiblick is a clown. He's just a clown. Oh, I, I, I don't think you ought to say that, Roderick. You can't call the officer in charge of security intelligence for a protected area a clown. Ah, but I will. <laughs> the urn was left in the cabin of a Mr. Brown, a tweed merchant. A tweed <laughs> merchant. <laughs> Precisely. Not no. at all. He's one of those pocket Hitlers up at Nobus Lodge. And his name isn't Brown. He's Lieutenant Pogost. <laughs> How, how can you say such a thing? I didn't the Island Queen bring him up to Nobust about a month ago? Mm. And didn't Captain McEchney himself tell me Bogus nearly drove him half daft with the questions he was asking? Well, well, if anyone here does obtain any information, I hope he will let me know at once. Secrecy is all important, but mystery is not. The only mystery is how that lot get their chops. Well, good night, Hall. <laughs> So, uh, what size of thing would this urn be at all? Oh, 
Uh, they can be pretty large at times. Yeah, they use the large urns for tea when there's too many people for a teapot. Because now I come to think of it, I saw Kenny Eosif and another Kiltod fellow carrying a sort of big, heavy black box up the gangway of the Queen. Aye. Uh, well, uh, there's one thing you can be sure. If that was the big black box that contained the human ashes, and they were after coming from Joseph McCroon, we'll never know now where they came from. No doubt about it, Jockey. Yon's coming from back east, You know, Hugh, I believe you're right. That's queer, she stopped so sudden. Aye. Well, she might have run into clear weather, I suppose. In a fog like this, she might as easily have run aground on the Goa. That's true. All the same, I think we should go and take a look. Curse, Mata. We'll go up as far as the head of the bag and see if we can catch sight of her. <laughs> Don't forget, Chucky. If she was outward bound, she might be full of nothing but ballast. But what ship would be setting a course through the Sound of Toddy if she were outward bound? True enough. And even if she is carrying ashes, she can hardly be full of that and nothing else. If there's a ship aground on the Goa at all, I'm sure there will be something in it for us. A year was And it could be Rome all the way from Jamaica. And do you think, Jockey, you could step a wee bit livelier? You take the lead, Ustjan, and I'll not be far behind you, boy. Here's Mata, this way. <laughs> Uh, are you, are you doing all right, Chucky? I'm oh. just fine. Don't you worry about me. You uh, wait. Uh, oh. uh, what's wrong? Uh, what is it? Tish, tish. Look. Who oh, uh, in the name of God is this too coming? Uh, uh, yes. Can you tell it's right beyond me? You're on, little Toddy. Uh, where in hell's that? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know at all where it is in hell, but I can tell you where it is on earth. It's two miles from Great Toddy, and you're at McCroon's Bay to the north of our island. Christian, uh, look yonder. Uh, you can see her now with a fog lift. Oh, I so you can. And she's hard and fast on the go, right enough. S. S. Cabinet Minister. Oh, here. She's lying terribly crooked. I shall not. Oh, what did I tell you, Robbie? She's a salvage job. First big sea's likely to break her back. Oh, well, at least Fritz will no get him now. What port were you making for? In New York. You were outward bound? Aye, aye, we were. How were you coming round the north end of it and you being outward bound? Well, until we learn the real reason, uh, we should maybe just put the blame on the cargo issue. <laughs> <laughs> Good a reason as any. Oh, there is a cargo in her then, A cargo in her? I think there is. <laughs> She's carrying 50,000 cases of whiskey, as the old minister. 50,000 cases? 50,000 uh, of whiskey. And nothing but the best. Twelve bottles in every case. <laughs> we counted them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, well. Glory be to God and his blessed mother and to all of holy saints. I see. So that's where I am, is it? Yeah, right on top of the goa. Uh, yeah, that's it exactly. Uh, what's our chances of floating off on the top of the tide? I would say, Captain, that there's much more chance the next big sea's liable to break her back clean into. Really? Uh, and there's always a big sea running between Pilly and Toddy when the tide's making and the wind is easterly. Mm, it's a gamble then, eh? Aye. Mm. I, I don't think you and me'd better be staying on board any longer than we have mm, to, Hugh. No, no, right enough. If this list was to get any worse, we maybe wouldn't be able to get off at all. Uh, we're away now, Captain, and arrange for carts and wagons for you. Uh, no, no, there's no need for that. The way the fog's lifting, we can row round to Snorvig in the lifeboats. Uh, well, you've a slack water cam now, so that's time to do it. You'll find good accommodation at the Snorvig Hotel, right enough. Aye, uh, pretty good accommodation, but uh, keep in mind there's very little beer there now. And no whiskey at all. None at all. Not a trap. <laughs> 
try I suppose Been like that for months Oh now that's bad But that I can do something about <laughs> This uh, this label seem alright to you? Stax Press <laughs> Given the choice Nobody in the two toddies would drink anything else no. Right, help yourselves. But no, no, that's not fair. I'll help you. Captain Slange of our boy. Slange of our Captain Puncher. You're good elf, gentlemen. I, uh, I wonder if the wind will come up. The glass is still high and steady. The glass is steady enough, Captain. But she's not as high as she was when you filled her for me. <laughs> what I mean, I was thinking I might leave a couple of my chaps on board until the salvage people took over. Uh, wait, you know best, Captain. Uh, but uh, you couldn't have a worse place than you are except when it's flat calm, as it is just now. When there's anything of a groundswell, it's just impossible to get ashore at all. Uh, yes, well, local knowledge. <laughs> if the minister has to be a total loss, at least I can make certain no lives are lost with her. Uh, Jockey and me will go straight to Kirtot and send word to Snorvik to look out for you before sunset. Oh, that would be helpful, thank you. And you'll not be forgetting there's not a drop of this stuff in Snorvik. No, I won't forget. And on that score, uh, perhaps you'd like to... Uh, Take these with you. Oh, more and dang, Captain Buncher. More and dang. Yes, indeed, Captain. Many, many, many thank yous. Ah, uh, well, who would have thought when we were walking to Mass this morning, lost in the deepest fog, that by the afternoon we'd be luxuriating on a sunlit shore like this. <laughs> what do you say, Jockey? <laughs> sunshine without and sunshine within. <laughs> well, we'll just have a bite to eat at home, and then we'll get the cart and drive along to Kirtod. I want to give my bottle to Father James. Oh, I wanted to give him my bottle. But we've had a tram out of yours. Oh, one bottle's enough for him just now anyway. <laughs> After all, there's 600,000 bottles where this came from. Thank <laughs> <laughs> ye. We'll just be saying three Hail Marys, you. Aye, for favours received. But first, we'll just have another wee suka too. After you. Oh, you're one of nature's gentlemen. Will you not be sitting quiet for more than one minute, Archie? And you little better, Alan Gilbrey. We're just keeping a sharp lookout for the weather, woman. Oh, for goodness sake. Be still for a moment. This is the only quiet day I have in all the week. The way they tell us, yon ship will be lying on the goa, Yelisish. If it uh, comes on to blow when the sun goes down, she might break in two before morning. The weather won't change one way or the other because you pair are forever jumping up and running to the door. Come back here to the fire and content yourselves like two sensible men. Oh. Do you know, Druby, Sabbath or no Sabbath, I've a good mind to take my boat out there right now. Oh, it's terrible right enough that a religious principle might deprive us of our fair share of what the good Lord has provided. Especially when you think what that lot over there might be enjoying now with their priests actually encouraging them to break the Sabbath. Oh, don't, that Viffer. That's more than Christian men should be asked to bear. Yes. Yes. I was thinking oh. I might just take the kitty wig round to the north end of Tuddy Beg and uh, take a look at her. No one would call that breaking the Sabbath. Eh? Wouldn't they? You know as well as I do, Ertie, what everyone would say as soon as they saw you and your boat out there in the coolish. Have some sense and let the ship bite till Monday. But do you think they're letting the ship bite till Monday over there on little Tuddy? Oh, you're, such, you're talking very grand about my sense, but where's your own woman? If the poor Papa Nich and Toddy Beck don't know better than to break the Sabbath, is it you that's wanting them to lead you by that great nose of yours into breaking it with them? I'm not sure it would be breaking the Sabbath just to have a bit look around. I'm not sure either. Are you not? 
I will, I'm not going to argue with you, Erty. We'll have been married 25 years next July, and if I'd argued with you every time you were wrong, I'd never be done arguing with you. You'll just go your own way, and if you want to be breaking the Sabbath, you'll be breaking it. Druby. Hey, I know what we'll do. We'll go tomorrow morning, right enough. But it'll be a tomorrow so close to today, you wouldn't get a heartbeat between them. Kerskill hour, a viver. I'm with you. We'll get down to the kitty wake, and on the stroke of midnight, we're off, boy, we're off. The Lord's mercies are indeed new every morning. Oh, it's a sin to laugh at people when it's not their fault they weren't born into the proper religion. But all the same, we sat up to watch them that night. And they nearly had us in hysterics as they crossed the coolest. <laughs> they tell me it was like the Spanish Armada crossing the channel. <laughs> the Presbyterian Armada. <laughs> right on the first stroke of midnight, the wee free flotilla set sail. Big boats, small boats, and some you would hardly call boats at all. Jostling and bumping the way you would think it was the beginnings of some kind of regatta. <laughs> Aye, the moonlight regatta. <laughs> I believe this weather will hold for a few days yet, Druby. Unless it comes on thick again. Ah, it might do that. Hello, the Who in the name of God's that? Who and you? It's all right, Dipper. That's Hugh McCrew. Hello! Hello, this is Archie McCrory and Alan Gilbraith in the Kittiwick. Ah. You've been a fairly long time coming. Aye, uh, something held us up. <laughs> well, that's just what we were thinking. Yeah, but never mind, boys. There's enough for everybody. Are you sure? Uh, for everybody from Barra Head to the butt of Lewis. Uh, by the looks of things, they're all here uh, now. There's plenty for everybody. Here, boys, catch. Oh. Oh. You'd better have a dram before you start work. Tap a late, Don't spare it, am I? You couldn't drink it all. No, not if you lived forever. Oh, Roy, and that's beautiful stuff. Damn the show, Druby. Oh, double A, I'd be for... <coughs> There's more bottles of that stuff aboard that ship than the biggest catch of herrings you two ever made in your lives. Oh, well, well, well. This won't put new heart in anybody. <laughs> when were they saying in Snorvig that the salvage men would be coming? Uh, they might be here with Tuesday's book. Oh, well, we must all do our best to lighten the work for. Them. We've rigged a rope ladder down into the hold. So long as the weather keeps good for a bit, we ought to get a tidy few cases out of her, the way she's lying now. Yeah, but don't bother to pick and choose. <laughs> it's all beautiful stuff, the whole lot of it. There's Highland gold and Highland heart down there. There's tartan milk and tartan perfection. Bluebell, Northern Light, Chief's Choice. Chiefs of the Glades, a hail at you, stalkers, giant fingers, cave. Deirdre's farewell, Lion Rathbun, road to the Isles, and over the border. Oh, yeah. And here, all the year round, a rusty plain of oh. old cataract. Do you know, Biffer, I don't know what's the matter with me, but I'm feeling much better. I'm feeling much better myself, Alan, okay? I don't think this war will last forever at all. Slut you Tell me, Druby, did you ever see a sight like that in your life before? Isn't it just like looking down into some holy place, some great cathedral, maybe? It's more to me like looking down through a handy-sized hole in the roof of a bonded warehouse. Oh, but look at them. The last time I saw a sight like that, it was in a film, a biblical film. And all the slaves trudging along in single file with the great stone blocks on their shoulders to build a pyramid. Only this time, they're taking the pyramid to pieces. Shall we just go down that ladder and join the slave gang? Willingly, boy. Willingly. Come in. Archie McCreary and Uncle Braith both want to see you. What's the matter with them? There's a strong smell of liquor. Already? I asked them why they didn't go to the surgery. They said it was business. Oh, well, in that case, we are the men. Don't forget, your lunch will be on the table in five minutes. Mm. You've just to go in. Uh. 
Doctor. Hello, Biffer. Hello, Drooby. Uh, what can I do for you both? Lion oh. rampant. Oh. Tart and perfection. Oh. Just for a start. <laughs> well, it's really kind of you chaps to think of me. I, I really do appreciate the thought. Ah, you'll be getting a case of such thoughts pretty soon, Doctor. Yeah, I suppose they must be doing pretty well on little Toddy. Ah, they're doing wonderful, and I'm glad they are. They couldn't have treated us better if we'd been born there. Plenty more where that comes from, boys. That was their slogan. <laughs> and did you see Father McCallus? Uh, no, we didn't get across until after midnight, but they say he was going about all evening looking pretty pleased with himself. <laughs> I was told he'd taken charge and was conducting it like a military operation. <laughs> I'm sure he was. <laughs> now listen, lads. Do you know what I'm going to do with this bottle? Drink it, I hope. No. I'm going to take this unopened over to old Hector McCrory at Knockdown so that he can have the pleasure of opening it himself. Oh, that's a really kind thought from yourself, Dr. McLaren. I'm sure old Echen will feel as if somebody has just uh, switched on the sun for him. Oh, I expect everybody's feeling a bit that way now. Aye, everybody except Big Roderick up at the hotel. <laughs> After weeks of waiting, he's been told to expect his first consignment on tomorrow's boat. <laughs> Right, Sergeant Major, what are your plans for the week? Well, sir, tonight, if you don't mind, I think I'd like to cross over the little toddy and then tomorrow, being Ash Wednesday, which is more or less a holiday for them over there... They're always having holidays on little toddy. Well, I thought it would be a good opportunity to give the local platoon some shooting practice. But it's, uh, it's just what you say, sir. Uh, you'd get back here by Thursday morning? That was my notion, sir. Right. Approved. Is that everything taken care of now? Uh, just one more thing, sir. Yes. Do you know what a ray jack is, sir? Something to do with radio location, I suppose. No, sir, it's a Gaelic word. It's when you announce your engagement, the betrothal. Really? Well, there's going to be a ray jack tonight for me and Peggy. I was wondering if you and Mrs Waggett will care to come to the party, sir. Well, it's very kind of you, Sergeant Major, but uh, transport may be a problem. I suppose you've heard about this shipwreck. Captain McKechnie was telling me about it on the way across from Obeck, sir. It's a heavy responsibility. For you, sir. Well, I feel we ought to guard the wreck until the salvage men arrive. I wouldn't trust the brigade of guards to look after that ship, sir. Stop trying to evade the issue, George. The sergeant major himself told me that your mother had absolutely forbidden you to come here tonight. Oh, please, let's not talk about that just now, Catherine. I insist we talk about it here and now. We're in danger of spoiling other people's enjoyment. Here and now, George. Well, and once and for all. Well, maybe at least go in there and close the door. If that's what you wish. Catriona, listen. No, you, George. I want a simple answer to my question. Did your mother or did she not forbid you to come here? Uh, yes, she did, but I paid no attention and I am here, Katriana. Oh, George, if she can forbid you to come to someone else's rage, what hope is there that she'll ever let you attend your own wedding? Why don't you leave me to deal with that? <laughs> You've been talking about dealing with that for months now. You've never dealt with that in your whole life. I will deal with it tonight. Maybe when my brother Norman goes into the RAF, I'll just volunteer for the ATS. If you must know, Katriana, I've already made inquiries about a ring. A ring? What kind of a ring? An engagement ring, of course. Oh. I asked the Sergeant Major where he got his, and I'll be going there myself shortly to choose one. Oh. Well, in that case, I'll maybe delay my decision about the ATS for a wee while yet. I'm going home tonight to tell my mother that you and I are going to be married at Easter. At Easter? Here now, how will I have enough couples to be marrying at Easter? I thought we'd go and get married in Glasgow. Oh, I'd rather be married in Glasgow myself, but we'll have to wait till the summer holidays. Ah, no. I've made up my mind. We're going to be married at Easter. Oh, it's just the whiskey that's talking. I admit that I probably wouldn't have been able to talk like this without the drums I've had this evening. But when the effect of them passes off, I'm not going back to being my mother's slave. No? No. If I'm in any danger, I'll take a few more drums. No, you'll not, not become a drinker if you're going to marry me. I may have to until we're safely married. So that's another reason for us to be married at Easter. Then I'll settle down. Did anyone ever hear the like of the way you're talking? Would 
you rather I spent the rest of my life just havering? No, I don't believe I would. So that's it settled then. We probably should go back in there and case they think we're up to something here. <laughs> They'll probably think that anyway, so we might as well give them something to go on. Oh, George. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, Sergeant Major Odd has chosen a lovely and beautiful girl. And he has been lucky enough to find that she chose him. <laughs> and now I'm going to reveal a secret. Some of you may be wondering why I am such a keen supporter of a mixed marriage. I'll tell you why. Sergeant Major Odd confided in me his desire to become a Catholic. Oh. And by the time he and Peggy Ellis sneak ran, kneel at the altar to be my man and wife on Wednesday in Easter week. Oh. It, oh. It, oh. It, oh. You're galloping ahead too fast, Father James. The date of the wedding is not yet settled. Ah, but it is settled, Joseph. Oh. I settled it myself. <laughs> to say before the county councillor for Toddy Beg interrupted me, when I marry them on Wednesday in Easter week, it will not be a mixed marriage at all. Yeah. Oh no, how about the tune in the pipes? Come along, I know. <laughs> Something to get our toes tapping. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, Father. Oh, 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 but before Mr. Chisholm gives us a tune, I should like to say just a few words. Certainly, Colonel, as many as you like. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasant duty to propose the health of my friend Joseph McCroon. Yeah. He has entertained us lavishly, and I'm sure we all wish to express our grateful thanks for such hospitality. Oh, yeah. And now I hope you'll none of you take it amiss if I utter a word of warning. I'm not going to beat about the bush. I dislike beating about the bush. Yes. Every man here knows that a steamer, the SS Cabinet Minister, was wrecked off the island two days ago, and that the greater part of the cargo consists of whiskey. <laughs> Uh, I want to ask you to beware of considering that this cargo belongs to you. Any of it that doesn't soon will do. <laughs> no, 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 it belongs to the government. This whiskey has been exported to America in order to lighten the grievous burden of the war against aggression. This war is now costing us... Really, no, Mr. Waggett, I don't think this is a suitable occasion for a political speech. I am not making a political speech speech, Father McAllister. I simply want the people of the two toddies to realise that the cargo of the cabinet minister is the property of the government. Uh, and that if they help themselves to government property, the penalties are very heavy. Uh, I think myself it's time we all paid a little attention to the business before us. Uh, and the business before us tonight is to enjoy ourselves. Uh, now if the government are concerned about the cabinet minister, it's up to them to take steps to I don't agree with you at all, Dr. McLean. Well, Mr. Waggett, you and I have disagreed so often on so many different questions, I don't think the world will come to an end if we disagree once more. <laughs> so shall we <laughs> I really don't know what's going to happen to these two islands. I think the warning you gave them tonight ought to be good, dear. Oh, I don't think any of them will pay the slightest attention. You and I take the trouble to cross the coolish in order to enter into the spirit of the island life, and all the thanks we get is Father McAllister calling me Colonel, which he knows I dislike, and then badgering me at the end to stand up and sing the British Grenadier. It really was too much. These Roman priests have too much power. I think he'd had too much to drink as well. Yes, well, I'm going to telegraph to Ferguson, the exciseman at Nobbers tomorrow. I think his presence here is urgently required. Wouldn't the people resent that? Dear? I don't care if they do. I'm not going to sacrifice my duty to cheap popularity. Uh, ah, he's got the blithering thing to work at last. 
may not drown at sea after all. I'm sorry for the delay, Captain Waggett. I think someone has been putting Minnie in my petrol tank. <laughs> Will it get us safely home now? No, just keep her a wee bit more to starboard, Captain. I can't keep her any more to starboard. The teller has not enough play between all this cargo you're carrying. I will just do your best, Captain. I take it these cases do contain whiskey. Aye, aye, that's Minnie right enough. We're loaded pretty deep. I, I wouldn't move about so much with hardly three inches of free boat. Are we in danger, then? Oh, no, you're safe enough, Mr. Swaggart. Uh. If you sit quiet. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, the only thing is, if the tide takes us past Snorvik, uh, we may have to go on to Gariboo. Go on to Gariboo? But how will Mrs. Waggett and I get home from there? Oh, just keep her as much to starboard as you can, and maybe we'll not miss the harbour at all. It'll be rather awkward for you if we fail to make the point at Gariboo and find ourselves facing the exciseman at Novast. Complete demoralization, that's what it is. Complete and utter demoralization. I was just oh. thinking, dear. What? If we do run into the exciseman, it won't look very good for you either, Paul. Thank you, Dolly. <laughs> ah, she won't be asleep. She'll be waiting up for me. It's all right, George. I was uh, just indulging myself. Do you know, Doctor, I feel as if the whole of my future life depends on what I say or do in the next few minutes. I think you're more than a little tight. I may be, I don't know. I've never been tight before. Well, the test will come when you're sober again. If <laughs> I find that being sober means being shy and feeble and unable to stand up to my mother, I shall get tight again, Doctor. Well, you'll have to watch out you don't become the slave of drink, George. I very nearly let it happen to me. If Catherine and I are to be married at Easter, I won't need drink to give me confidence. Yes. Yes, you're lucky, George Campbell. <laughs> I know I am. Yes, yes, you're a very lucky chap. I also think you're in just the right mood to tackle your mother tonight. Uh, thank you for running me home. I would not have missed the opportunity. Aikabama. Aikaba, and good luck to you. And what have you to say for yourself? I have a great deal to say, but I'm not going to start a conversation in the hall. You're not. Go into the sitting room, Mother, while I take this case of whiskey along to the dining room. Case of... Did you say case of whiskey? Yes, yes, don't pretend you're deaf. George, you're drunk. If I am, it's nobody's business but my own. Will you make us a cup of tea? Are you talking to me? Your mother? There are a few things I want to talk over with you and would both be the better of a cup of tea. I will certainly not start making tea at this hour of the night. Then I'll make myself a dram. You do no such thing, George. And I'm still waiting for an explanation of your behaviour. It's very simple. I've been to the right. After I told the sergeant major you couldn't possibly go. The sergeant major told me what you said, which made Did me, he which which made me absolutely determined Despite to go. Me Sit down, please. Thank you. Now then, Katriana and I are going to be married next month. Have you gone mad, George? No. I've gone sane. I think we'd better resume this talk tomorrow when you're sober. No. When I was small, you terrorised me. And my father, who had a kindly side to him, hadn't the pluck to interfere. I suppose you terrorised him from the moment you married him. You Please th don't interrupt. I'm doing the talking. And now. forgetting the fifth commandment. I never want to hear that commandment again. Bless. For me now. I don't want to turn you out of the house, but that's what I will do unless in future you do what I say in all matters oh. affecting me. <laughs> you said to me that if I married Katrina, you'd go to live with Antina and Glasgow. All the same, you are my mother, and I feel I ought to give you a chance to pull yourself together. Oh, so, please. if you write to Katrina to invite her to come back with me after church on Sunday and spend the day with us, oh, and oh, if, oh. when she comes, you welcome her her as a daughter, and oh. if you give her all your coupons, I'll try to persuade Katrina that when we get married next month, and when she comes to live at Garibou, you'll keep your own place in the house and won't attempt to take mm, hers. Never, but, but, if you'd rather not put your pride in your pocket, 
Why then, I think you better telegraph to Antina that you'll be crossing to Obik by Saturday's boat and will arrive in Glasgow that night. Have you forgotten that the furniture in this house is all mine? No, I haven't forgotten that. I'll have your furniture sent down to the pier. George Campbell, if you bring that MacLeod girl to this house, I'm telling and you... And I'm you're... telling you to go to bed and think it over. And I'll tell you this. I wouldn't give you that chance if I didn't blame myself a bit. Aha! Yes, I blame myself for not having told you before what a proud, self-centred and domineering old kayak you really are. Who on earth can that be? We can only pray to some more whiskey. Captain Waggett. I'm sorry to bother you at this time, Sergeant Campbell, but I wonder if I might use your telephone. Of course. Come in, Mrs. Waggett. Thank you. But what's happened? Uh, we need transport to get us back to Snorvig. I'd better telephone before I tell you the whole sad story. Help yourself, Captain. But I hope you get an answer at this time of night. Oh, they're on duty all night at the post office now. I spoke to Donald McCrory about it. The whole point of having a telephone is that it must be answered at any hour. At any hour. It might be better for me to get hold of Angus McCormack. He has a pony and trap. Come on. Come on. Mother. Yes, George. Will you see to our guests Come while on. I'm gone? Yes, George. Thank you, Mother. They'll probably want tea. Yes, George. Oh, tea. It's a How waste nice. of time. Hopelessly unpatriotic, of course. And after all, I... Hello. Ah, oh, at last. <sighs> Who is it? I'm calling from the schoolhouse at Caribou. Uh, do, do you want the doctor's house, Mr. Campbell? Uh, this isn't Mr. Campbell. This is Captain Waggett. This is the post office. I know it's the post office. Is that you, Mrs. McCrory? Uh, uh, Mrs. McCrory is in bed asleep. Where's Mr. McCrory? Uh, is it... Uh... Mr. McCrory, the hotel you're wanting, or, or Mr. McCrory, the merchant? No, 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 Mr. Donald McCrory, the post office. Ah, uh, well, the, they were after carrying Donald Ian home to bed two hours back and more. Well, did he have an accident? <laughs> Maybe he <it> did. <laughs> they found him a slip in the telephone kiosk. <laughs> uh, look, look here, you. Mrs. Waggett and I are stranded at Garibou and must get hold of transport. Uh, what name was that you said? Waggett. Captain Waggett. W for wind, A for accident, G for George, and G for Gary Boo, E for effort, T for two, and two confounded T's. Oh, George, I'll take the wagons back in the kitty wick after we get the rest of the mini out of <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever intend to get to snore? Oh, no, no. I had a big cargo to deliver to Gary Boo here. Fifteen cases, two pounds a case, huh? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, I ought to be getting back to let the wagons know where they stand. Uh, uh, are you sure Angus can't take them in his trap? No, 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 no. We'll need the trap to get all the mini safely stowed away out to sight before daylight. When can you take them home, then? Uh, I'll tell them to get down to the boat by three o'clock and we'll have them back in Snorvig in time for a fine early breakfast. The tide will have turned before we start. Ah, right then. I give him a half of it. I give him a half of it. Well, well, well. Well, well, eh? No saw such a change in any man. If I took that drum like a warrior. Like a real warrior. Are you, are you for a drum, Captain? Ah. Look here, Archie. I do think you're playing a dangerous game. And what way dangerous, Captain? I feel pretty sure the Sheriff could put you in prison for what you've been doing oh, tonight. Oh, if the Sheriff put me in prison, he'd be sending plenty others to prison with me. Yes, but you ought to set an example. After all, you are a corporal in the Home Guard. But if we don't unload the stuff ourselves, there'd be plenty from all about would be unloading it. They're round yon ship already, like... Like flies on a sunny south window. It's wrong. Whoever does it. Oh, Captain. This fine weather won't last forever. If there came a heavy sea, the minister might break in half the way she's lying. Now, we'd all feel pretty foolish if we just left all that fine whiskey for the fishes, eh? Would we not, Captain? 
You've had the living proof tonight, old lady, of what I've been saying. What was that? Both these islands are now on the verge of a complete moral collapse. Oh, if you say so, dear. Yes, it, it seemed strange at the time to many of us. All the salvage people seemed to be interested in was the ship and not the cargo. So four of their men worked all day and every day for a fortnight, just dumping the whiskey into the sea, while all night and every night for two weeks, a Hebridean armada carried the remainder away to safety <laughs> over the seas. <laughs> that went merrily on, harming no one, till the storms finally came and broke the minister's back. The salvage men went back to the mainland again, and that might have been the end of the matter altogether, had it not been for Captain Waggett and some more of his official reports. I don't believe it. I simply don't believe it. What are you looking at, dear? Here, yeah, see for yourself. That boat leaving the harbour. You know I'm not very good with binoculars. I focused them for you, Dolly. It's quite extraordinary. It's entirely through my initiative that action is being taken at last. And then nobody comes near me when the whistle blows. Isn't that Constable McRae standing in the bows? Exactly. They might as well send up flares to warn the enemy of their approach. But who are the other two men with him? The tall one, believe it or not, is Major Quiblick. His companion is Ferguson, the exciseman from Novus. <laughs> it would be comic if it weren't rather tragic. Father James! Father James! I'm here, Jockey! Father James, there's a boat on its way over from Snorvig and three men in uniform on her. An army man, an excise man, and Macrae, the policeman. How far away? Halfway here. I hear no Vianna, she. Where's you? I've sent for him. He'll be on his way. Right. You get down to Picky at the post office and tell her to get busy on the telephone. After that, you make sure everybody in Kiltod knows about it. But what about your own but stuff? Here's Hugh. He'll give me a hand. Off with you now and Picky first, man. <laughs> You've got the news then, Father Chief. Ah, oh, bad news indeed, Father. Oh. Though, mind you, I warned you fellows. One for the pot is one thing, but when you started selling the stuff, you were bound to attract trouble. Now, you come and give me a hand to push my lot further back into the chapel loft. Oh, anywhere in the loft won't be a very safe place if they really start searching. I agree, so we'll bring a couple of cases down and I'll sit on them in the confessional just in case. Come on now, there's a lot of work ahead of us. Oh, no. What is it now, Paul? Instead of going straight in for the kill that killed Todd, the blithering idiots have turned away and are heading round to the wreck fast, with the three of them standing out on deck in full uniform. It's like the Portsmouth Review. Oh, well, I give up. They might as well have telephoned in advance to inquire if this might be a suitable morning to call. One could be forgiven for thinking it was done deliberately. Well, with my father being away in Edinburgh, trying to get a licence to sell liquor at the post office, and with all those cases of mini just lying on the floor of his shed, my sister Kate Anne and myself didn't know what to do for the best at all. We were sure we were for the jail, and our father too, probably. <laughs> So, well, in desperation, I took the bull by the horns. And with hammers and chisels, we prized open the cases and just poured <laughs> every bottle away into the good earth. <laughs> I tell you, before we were done, our heads were spinning with the fumes. Oh, but at least we knew we were doing the right thing. <laughs> That's what we thought, Lord Father came back from the mainland. Hiku <laughs> and share. Hicko! Hicko! Hey, and grass! Cavalch you! Oh, my whiskey! So I just explained calmly that the constable had been coming and we had no choice but to act as we did. Oh, daughters! Oh, on, Moruya! Daughters are just a burden and a misery to a man! Your mother would never have done such a fool of a thing. Never. She had more sense in her. Daughters. 
So just, I just seized my forward. chance and reminded him that I didn't want to be any man's daughter anymore, that I wanted to be a man's wife. And that it was himself who was keeping me back. Well, it's me would far sooner see you married on to any man than have you here and pouring away any more of my stalker's joy on me. Good, I said. Clever. Then Father James can be reading the bands out in church next Sunday and I'll have an Easter wedding after all. <laughs> well, well... First of all, I must say what a joy it's been to an old woman to find her only son making such a sensible choice as what Fred has made in marrying my daughter-in-law Peggy. <laughs> You'll often hear that mothers-in-law are a nuisance, which in fact I think they very often are. <laughs> well, my son will tell you I never tried to interfere in his life ever since he was on his own. Mind you, I don't say there wasn't times when I wanted to interfere, <laughs> when I felt I ought to interfere, but I never did. If he don't know his mind at his age, nobody else is going to know it for him. That's one sure thing. And I'll tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, apart from falling in love with my daughter-in-law, Fred fell in love with little Toddy itself. Yeah. Who should it? I don't blame him. I'm falling in love with little Toddy myself. <laughs> Unfortunately, my stay here will be all too short, but make no mistake about it, I'm coming back to spend a real holiday here as soon as ever I can. Oh, and I hope my son's father-in-law will invite me. Oh, there's no doubt about that, Mr. Zard. You'll have the freedom of little Toddy. I personally will see to it. <laughs> but once in my life, what? I don't know as I've anything much more to say. <laughs> Except, thank you one and all for your kindness to me and my son. Here I can't hardly believe I landed here only yesterday afternoon, for I never felt so much at home in any place outside London. <laughs> God bless you all. That was really beautiful, Mrs. Arden. Uh -huh. You'll need a small sensation after that. Well, what have you there, Joseph? A white label. Your duty paid. I'm very glad to hear it. I'm sure you will be, Colonel Waggett. I'm sure you will be. Tell me, Joseph, did you buy this whiskey from Rory Moore at Norwich Hotel? I did, Father. How many bottles? Uh, just sufficient, Father. <laughs> ah, Joseph, you're a great diplomat. <laughs> and now the bride and groom will lead us all into a good old fashioned dance to the posh to be there you are now that's the same posh to be we danced to 50 years ago do you remember that i Jeff? do indeed go but if you'll excuse me, I think we'll sit it out this time round. <laughs> oh, I happy, happy memories. Uh, George Campbell and his Katrina were at our wedding. Then they went down to Glasgow and got married themselves. Fifty years ago this yeah. month. Well, all I can say is that those years have sat very lightly on the pair of you. I wonder, Fred, if you'd care to tell us how old you are. I was 45 the year the minister went aground. <laughs> You're 95? Yeah. Oh, you look wonderful. And you, Peggy. Are you going to reveal your age for us? Well, let's, do, let's just say I'm over 21. <laughs> That's what she, she told me when I asked her before we were engaged. <laughs> well, in those circumstances, there has to be one final question. What is your recipe for such a golden old age? Ah, that's an easy one. What else would it be but... Uska better gulerit. Take it in moderation, of course. Lunch of our afieki. I guess it's a yeah, want you hen, Fred. <laughs> In Whiskey Galore by Compton Mackenzie, dramatised by Hector Macmillan, Bernard Holly was Old and Young Fred, Delina McLennan, Old Peggy, Donalda Samuel, the interviewer, Michael Elder, McCroon, Bill Riddock, McCrory. Druby was played by John Shedden, Biffer by Paul Young, Mrs Biffer by Eliza Langland, Norman by Finlay MacLean and Catriona by Alexis Daly. Stella Forge was Mrs Waggett, Raymond Ross, Waggett, John Buick, Father McAllister, Tony Kearney, George, Maraid Ross, Mrs Campbell, Charles Kearney, Dr Mack, Alan Sharp, Jockey and John Ramage, Hugh. The director was Hamish Wilson.